And let's read Mark chapter 4, picking up at verse 35. And on the same day, when evening had come, he said to them, them being his disciples, let us cross over to the other side. Now when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was. And other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already feeling. But he was asleep in the stern, or the back of the boat, on a pillow. And they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he arose and rebuked the wind and the sea, saying, Peace, which literally means be quiet, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said to them, his disciples, Why are you so fearful, and how is it that you have no faith? Or literally, how is it that you still have no faith? And they feared exceedingly, and said to one another, Who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? Now this story we're looking at takes place at the Sea of Galilee. In Israel. We're going to look at that in detail in a little bit, but for now, the Sea of Galilee is a very fruitful place. It's a very life giving region. It supplies 50% of the drinking water to the nation. The tilapia there are to die for. The fishing is great. The food is great. People who live there live there because it's filled with life. But as you travel Israel, and if you can, you should, it's quite the experience, let me tell you. As you travel to the south, there's another sea that's just the opposite. It lives up to its name. In fact, it's appropriately called the Dead Sea. There's a lot of different differences between those seas, but the main one is this. The Sea of Galilee has flow going into it. The Dead Sea has flow going into it. But the Sea of Galilee has flow going out of it. The Dead Sea does not. It's just an accumulation basin. It takes, 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 and never gives. Versus the Sea of Galilee takes in and gives out. Takes in and gives out. It's healthy. It gives life. It's vibrant. People want to be around it because there's blessing associated with it. The Dead Sea, not so much because it's well just dead. If you try to put life in it, it's not going to go so well. In fact, it's going to go belly up. It's going to croak. It's going to die. This is rightly these two seas... Over time, if you've been around Christianity for very long, been compared to two types of Christians. Those who are vibrant. Those who others like to be around. Those who give life. Those who are fishers of men. Those who not only take, but they also realize the words of the Lord Jesus when he said, it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. And other people who, well, you know, you're always on the take, you're looking out for what's for you, and you don't really want to do anything or give anything that costs you anything, and well, there's a lot of deadness there, and you wonder why people aren't so keen about visiting your destination. (laughs) As we follow this, we're going to see here that Jesus is going to make sure, absolutely sure, that his followers become like the sea they're on. The bearers and givers of life. They are going to have an opportunity. God will see to it. Jesus Christ will see to it. The Spirit will set it up so that you and I have the opportunity to flow out. To give out. Not to suck it up, to take it in, to be dead. And when you get by the Dead Sea, I can tell you, you can tell because there's quite a fragrance there. I've been there. And in some others, there's the fragrance too, but Christ wants to give us as it says in 2 Corinthians, the fragrance of life, the aroma of Jesus in every case. Now, Jesus would often ditch the crowds. He would escape the crowds with his disciples, but this is a little different. This isn't the case. He is going to teach them a very powerful lesson on the Sea of Galilee this evening. We will follow along. If you're taking notes, first couple of verses, let's look at the calm before the storm. The calm before the storm. It says, On that same day when evening had come, he said to them, Let's go to the other side. Now that when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was, and other little boats were with him. It says, On that same day, 
meaning the day that's recorded for us in Mark's Gospel, chapter 4, where verse 1, he starts to teach. And then he teaches, and he continues to teach. And we get parables that he taught on, the parable of the sower. The four types of soil. And I can tell you, at my kitchen table, which, by the way, dads, is a great place to feed your kids the Scripture. You have a captive audience. You have that which they desire on their plate. And if you have them in that spot, don't only feed them physically, feed them spiritually. We went over the four types of soil, specifically focusing on the third type of soil, that the weeds that grow up are the deceitfulness of riches and the cares of this world. And we talked about the best way Christians can combat that. Jesus gave that parable this day. The storm is for later. That's the sound effect for later. <laughs> Last service we were late, now we're early. He gave the parable of the lamp. You know the one, hide it under a bush. Oh no, I'm going to let it shine, right? Some of you who didn't go to Sunday school, I don't get it, man. That's a song we used to sing back in the day in Sunday school. Comes right here. The parable of growth and how it happens and how you can't manufacture it. You put the seed in the ground, you water, you let the sun do its thing. Farmer, you go to sleep and let God do what God can do because the power's in the seed. The mustard seed, the growth, that which takes off out of something small can be something big. And in verse 33, it says he spoke many more parables. He had a day full of ministry. If anybody here has ever done any type of public speaking, teaching, or training any teachers in the house today, God bless you. The only thing that saves your life is that schedule, getting the weekends, holidays, and two months off of summer. Otherwise, you would die. My wife's a teacher. I know this. It's exhausting. And he's teaching. He's never lazy. And he's about redeeming the time, fulfilling his Father's will. And in his humanity, he would often push himself to the point of exhaustion. Have you ever done that? Back in my younger years, I used to work a graveyard in a grocery store. We always had to work the holidays. Why? Because you all want to go to the store and buy stuff on the holidays. We were busy <laughs> buying stuff for your Thanksgiving baskets for 412 Church and all that kind of stuff. Somebody's got to put that on the shelf. So we would work graveyard, but then we wouldn't want to go home and sleep. We'd want to celebrate the holidays. So I remember me and my friend Mike, we stayed up for over two days one time. And we were Christians. We were straight. We weren't on anything. We were just, and I remember you, you hit that point where I can't go anymore. I'm going to lay down for a while. 17 hours later, I wake up. I guess the story is people had, they tried to come and wake me up, but I, was, I wasn't moving. They caught a pulse and saw my chest going up and down and said, I guess he's okay. He's just tired. And you wake up from that and you're like, wow, that was sheer and utter exhaustion. Jesus pushes himself to that. He gave it all, left nothing on the court, as we say in the sports world. So as we leave this day of teaching of parables, we move to an event which Jesus himself is going to powerfully demonstrate his deity that he is God the creator and sustainer of the universe. So he says to his followers, hey guys, let's go. Let's go to the other side. They are obedient to his word. They heed the call and they launch out to the other side. And when it says they took him just as he was, that means on the fly. Now I'm kind of a planner. I like things in a row. When somebody comes impromptu, I had a friend Adam one time. He's got four kids. Okay, I think he learned to live on the fly because with four kids, nothing ever goes as planned. I've got two, so at least it's, you know, equal numbered. Me and my wife, you get this one, I'll get that one. So a lot of times we can stick to the plan. But we were at his house, and it was like 9.30 at night, and he says, hey, man, who wants to go get some tacos? Let's go. And he grabs his keys, and I'm like, are you crazy? And he says, no, I, I have to just go on the fly, because whenever the opportunity presents itself, I do it. And so here with Jesus, they didn't make any plans, no preparation, just as he was, which, by the way, if you're really going to take Jesus, you have to take him as he is. On his terms. You can't redefine what you like and sort of minimize what you don't like. If you want the Savior, you got to take the whole thing. He is the one who tells us, and we take him as he is. Now, when they got in the boat, the Greek word for boats, generic, it's most commonly the fishing boats that they were used to. These boats were equipped with oars so they could row. They also had a mast, so if the wind was favorable, they could lift a little sail and be pushed along. 
The same event is also recorded for us in Luke chapter 8, and again in Matthew chapter 8, and in Luke's gospel, it tells us, but as they were sailing along, and the Greek word for the word sail is paleo, and it means literally that, to sail. Why is that important? Because Luke's a doctor. He's a physician. He's an intellect. He's a scientist. He's very technical. So when you read through Luke's gospel, the Greek words have strict meaning. There's a different Greek word, which means to row. That is plow no. So Luke says, there was plowing? No. They were sailing along. The wind was at their back. There's a nice breeze. They got to put the oars away and move on. And the picture here in the original language in the Greek is that they're literally plunging through the water. And here's the fun part we like. The work that they're putting in to reach their destination is at this point minimal. Isn't that a good thing? The work that I put in to accomplish what I want is at this point minimal. The wind's at their back. They're on their way. And what do we call this, saints? We call this smooth sailing. (laughs) Welcome to sailing the smooth seas with Jesus and the disciples. We say, so far, so good. Put our Ebenezer stone up. The Lord has helped us such far at this moment, at this time. It's all good. All's perfect. They're tuning in saying, God, you're so good. Hallelujah. And it's easy to sing that when things are good. Now, if we could just put a period here (laughs) and stop, things would be great. Remember Peter when he was on the Mount of Transfiguration? He went up with James and John, and Jesus literally peels back his humanity, shows forth his glory. Peter sees it all, the prophets are there, the Father speaking from heaven, and Peter says, this is where I want to live. Let's build some houses, some booths, some tabernacles. I'm going to make you guys some. Let's hang out here up on the mountain. And what does the Father say? Peter, why do you answer when nobody asked? Shush. I can imagine James and John coming down the mountain that day saying, we could have saw that for longer, Peter, if you didn't open your big mouth. Everything had to stop and you had to get corrected. But we like to live there. This is what a lot of us seek. We love those times and we need to be careful because we can start to live our lives so that we can stay on the easy street. Never try anything risky. God's saying this, but I'm not sure. That might rock my boat and produce the opposite of the smooth sailing that I love so much. Like vacation. Vacation's awesome, isn't it? I still love vacation. Because I leave my job and I come back and they give me a paycheck and I wasn't even there. (laughs) The bed's messy. Somebody comes and cleans it. This is, there's plenty of stuff to do. I could just relax, not a care in the world. And we need to be careful because spiritually we can somehow switch our theology to think this. If I can just obey good enough and I can stay tight with Jesus and close to my Savior, smooth seas ahead. Smooth seas ahead. I need to pray more. I need to read more. Maybe I should fast. Maybe... I'm not close enough. If I stay close enough to the Lord, nobody's going to rock my boat. Be careful of that, saint. Be careful of that, sister. As we see this morning, there's a big folly in that way of thinking. And it's simply this. Jesus is no longer your goal. An easy life is your goal. Jesus said, in this world, you will suffer tribulation. John 6, 33. But take heart, I have overcome the world. J.C. Ryle said this, Many of God's children go on very well, so long as they have no trials. And if your goal in life is simply smooth sailing, you will be greatly disappointed and greatly disillusioned. Have you met people like this who have said something along these lines? With Christianity, referring to a relationship with Christ. Yeah, I tried that. Yeah, I I used to be into that. What are they essentially saying? Oh, back to the parable of the sower. They're confessing they're the rocky soil. They hear it, they come to Christ, think this is going to be smooth sailing, I'll follow Jesus, I'll never have another care problem in the world. 
And the moment the sun comes up and things wax hot, it says that they shrivel up because they did not have any depth of root within themselves. All this teaching, all this teaching, all this teaching. Listen, saints, the teaching is to prepare you for the trouble. The transfiguration of the mountain is to prepare you for the demons that were down there in the valley. Do you remember the story? As they come down, there's a demon-possessed man they have to deal with. And if you fast-forward through this story, when they get to the other side, that's when the man of Gennesaret comes with all the demons in him. The teaching is to prepare you for the times of trouble. The mountain experiences get you ready for the valley. The calm before the storm. Number two, if you're taking notes this morning, let's look at the storm itself, the storm during the storm in verse 37 and 38. There was a great windstorm that arose. The waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. And he was in the stern, asleep on the pillow. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Now the Sea of Galilee, it's really a, a geographic, unique spot. There's nowhere like it in the world. It's the lowest freshwater lake on the planet. 682 feet below sea level. As I said, very productive, very fruitful, 50% of the drinking water, the fish. It's fed by the Jordan that comes down from Mount Hermon. Surrounded by mountains. On the west and northwest, the mountains go up 1,500 feet. If you ever climbed 1,500 feet, you know that's a lot. On the other side, the northeast and the east, they rise double that. 300 feet, the miles run 42 miles all the way up to the Golan Heights, the lake itself. 13 miles by 8 miles, it's sitting in a huge bowl right in the middle of a long wind tunnel, and you have 30 miles from the Mediterranean with that weather system also. One historian says that the waves during one storm were so big that they washed up to the city of Tiberias. It's a unique geography. We have winds here. We have our Santa Anas. The waves from storms on the Sea of Galilee would go 5 to 10 feet. Anybody ever been in the water? It doesn't seem like a lot, but when you're in the water with five to ten feet, right? Some of you ex-surfers over there, I see you nodding your head. I used to surf too back when I was smaller. (laughs) Back when I could float on my board. That's crazy stuff. The power that is generated. The sheer raw and utter power. You're no match for it. If you've lived in the valley for a long time, you know we do get hardcore Santa Ana's. This is San Jacinto. It's back in 2007. It happened again in 2014. The great windstorms that blow the sand that covers cars, that they need tractors to clear the street. Listen, just living in this area meant that the conditions were constantly right for a sudden storm. Can I say that again, Christian? Just living in this area meant that the conditions were constantly right For a sudden storm, much like the world we live in spiritually. Conditions being that we are living in a fallen world filled with sin and it's inhabited with sinful people. And listen to me. It's not heaven till it's heaven. There's no storms in heaven, but it ain't heaven till it's heaven. And while you're on earth, what's the forecast? Storms on the horizon, saint. Storms on the horizon. And today, hopefully, you'll get a little piece to batten down the hatches so you can navigate a little more successfully, maybe than we've done in the past. The storms became a part of the culture because that's just where they live. For us, we live in a storm-filled climate. Spiritually speaking, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against literal powers, principalities, forces of darkness in the heavenly place. Did you catch that term, wrestle? Storm. As Christians, as believers, we should be those that understand our climate. We should know this, that storms are literally a normal part of the process. Peter puts it this way, don't think it's strange that the fiery ordeal which is to try you as if some strange thing were happening. You know what that means? When you go through something as a result of being a Christian, don't freak out like you don't know what's going on. Know that this is part of the package. No, the big picture from the beginning, the one who created is the one who's going to culminate. The one who came once will come twice and redeem us to himself. Until then, you will suffer tribulation. 
But take heart, I have overcome the world. For so many, when we first experience this, the storms can be rather shocking. And we wonder, what are we doing wrong for this to happen? Go back to the beginning of this passage. Whose idea was this little crossover trip? Jesus. The disciples, in response to the command of Jesus, ended up in a storm. And yes, you need to evaluate. I create plenty of storms for myself, no doubt. I'm sure you do too. But there are times, saints, when just because of following the Lord, things get stirred up. And I'm here to tell you, that's okay. And that's right where you want to be. Why? Because Jesus commanded you to do it. And he's right there in the boat with you. We need to have good biblical storm theology. Indeed, sure enough, a storm did come down in those conditions. And it came down hard that night. In verse 37, the New American Standard says it's a fierce gale, which is a term used to describe a hurricane. In the original Asian, very strong, very descript. Matthew 8, as I said, this same account is recorded there. Seismos megas, we know what that means without even understanding Greek. Mega means huge. It's used of natural disasters, an event of major proportion. Matthew 8 also tells us, if we were to take the time to read that account this morning, that it's dark. It's night. And I don't know why, we were talking to somebody after first service, but why are things more spooky in the dark? I don't know, even as a kid, they just are, right? You can be in the same place all day for a week, but at night, I don't want to go outside. Well, you've been out there all the week, it's okay. It adds to the terror for this, now that the light is gone. In Luke's account, he says literally that the boat is being swamped, meaning that in the same way we get into bed at night and cover ourselves with the covers because we love this chilly fall weather, that the waves are covering the boat, that they can't bail out the water fast enough as they look at this little bucket and cope, little cup they have, and they see the hundreds and thousands of gallons that are coming in five to ten foot waves their way. Now these are fishermen, many of them. They understand the culture in which they live. They made their living around the Sea of Galilee. They were used to storms. But this one... They knew they were in over their head. They knew this one was over the top. Why? Because this is something God ordained. These winds, Jesus is seeking to demonstrate that he's greater than the greatest storm. He can help them overcome the unprecedented and the absolute worst thing that the world can throw at them, even if it's something that they are experiencing now in the essence to say, I've never seen anything like this before. You ever had one of those trials? Ever one of those storms blow through? And now I've heard about this, but I've never heard about anything like that. A funeral Saturday. Tragic. Is that family going through a storm? And what's their encouragement? What's their word to us as their church family? Pray we want God to be glorified. That's successful storm navigation. It's a lesson on faith. In spite of this storm, Jesus remains asleep how truly exhausted he must have been. And he's asleep because this is a lesson for his disciples. Now, no one else was calm. And I'll tell you, I, I've learned when I get into a certain situation, I know who the experts are. There's certain people, if I'm in a situation and I see them get nervous, time for me to get nervous. You know what I'm talking about. If you see that guy run or that, guy, that girl run, you better run. When the fishermen have to look to a carpenter to solve the storm problem, Houston, you know you got an issue. (laughs) There's times when we feel like what's supposed to hold us together, our little boat, it's equipped with oars, it's equipped with sails, it's supposed to get us to where we need, feels like it's getting beat apart. The very thing which is designed to keep you afloat is sinking you like your marriage, your kids in rebellion, your job, your boss, your coworkers, your finances. You're looking at what you have to alleviate the problem. And it's equivalent to what they had in a little bowl or a cup. And you're seeing the magnitude of what's coming in. We're perishing. This is pure pandemonium at this point. 
You have seasoned fishermen saying, this is it. We are going down. And in my mind, I wonder what's going through their mind. Because if I'm there, I'm thinking, when do I jump? When do I yell abandon ship? When do I yell abort mission? Where do I just try to save myself? I want to tell you, if that's you in that marriage, in that job, with those finances, dealing with those kids, don't sh- jump ship. Instead of fretting over the ship, try calling on the Savior. In the worst of circumstances, call on the Savior. Now, was this a perfect call to the Savior? Uh, Jesus, excuse me, we know you're the divine creator of the universe. We thank you for sustaining our life up until this point. We know, God, that thou holdest our very breath and thou life. This is important. You've got to get spiritual and use some King James language because you're really in trouble. <laughs> no, they're totally wrong. Totally wrong. The request is not a question, it's a statement. Don't you care that we're perishing? God, you don't even care that I'm going down. Look at us here and you're over there sleeping. What's the matter with you? But I want to point this out. Did it work? Imperfect saint. Christian, prone to wander. Prone to sin. Call to the Savior. Even if you're not following every ordinance, call to the Savior. Even if your walk's not where it should be, call to the Savior. Jesus said, if you call to me, I will answer you. If you call to me in my name, you have asked for nothing until this point. Ask in my name and I will hear you. It doesn't have to be perfect. You just have to know the perfect one. And call to Him. Don't jump. The storm is raging. They believe they're going down. He's sleeping. There's times in our lives where it's going to seem like God is unaware. Or if He is aware, He's unconcerned with the problems we're going through. And our minds can get twisted. The enemy starts to whisper, if God loved you, then why would this be happening? Sounds like Job. Remember Satan came to God? Look at your servant Job. Of course he loves you. You bless him. Let me take away his blessings and see what happens. Right? Right? Why did this happen? God, why did you let this go so far? I followed you and looked what's happening. I mean, I had a time in my life where I lost my job and I lost my church. And somebody had told me, how can you trust God through this? And I remember looking at him and saying, I got nothing else, man. He's all I got right now. If I want to keep my house and keep my family, this is it. I don't, I'm not despising him. I'm looking to him. We got nothing else. These storms in our life, when you go through them, you see Jesus in a way that you never could if it was smooth sailing all the time. If you want to be made like Christ, even if you don't, God wants you to be like Christ. And He will stop at nothing to transform you into the image of His Son. Jesus Christ. It can happen no other way than the storms of life as we pass through what's been called the crucible of affliction. But here's the thing about miracles that's a bummer. The stage has to be set for them. What do I mean by that? In the tabernacle, Jesus says to the man with the withered hand, stretch out your hand. It's a miracle. What's the problem? He had to be stuck with the withered hand since he was born. Jesus said to the man, get up and walk. What makes that miraculous? Well, he's lame from birth. With Lazarus, we just saw resurrection power a few weeks ago. The bummer about resurrection power is it only works in the graveyard. It's got to be associated with something that is death. That's the tough part. And so too with us, God loves us enough to allow us to go through the trials, even divinely ordains them, to transform us, to make us like Jesus. It's been rightly said that God loves us just the way we are, but he loves you too much to leave you just the way you are. 
And when you feel like you're facing impossible situations and all your human resources, you, you pile them up and they pale in comparison to the overwhelming situation that you face, it's almost like a black hole. Where everything you throw at it just gets sucked in. A while back I ran across this article where scientists saw light coming out of a black hole for the first time. Evidently, at the time of this, there are certain things that get sucked into a black hole, and when they get sucked into the black hole, they emanate light. I thought about that for Christians. Emanating light. Letting light come out of darkness. Everything which has such a strong vortex, which will suck anything into, but yet there's another power that can override that, can overrule that. It makes me think of John chapter 1, verse 5. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it, or overpower it. God's light is greater than the blackness of the darkest black hole. He has a way of coming through when things seem impossible to us. And I would love to stay here all day. Don't worry, I won't. I'll get you out on time to tell you testimony after story. I could listen to you and you could tell me that's nothing, kid. Wait till you're my age. I'll tell you what God's really going to do and what he has done. He is faithful to us. He calms the storm. Peace be still, he says. Peace literally means to hush. So we say shh. It's a nice way of saying hush. It's kind of hard. But if you say shh, it's a little nicer. It means to be mute, have the inability to speak, to muzzle, to become speechless. He does that to the wind. He does that to the waves so that the Bible says this, that there is a great calm. It's that word mega again. Intense, massive, to the great extent. You don't use that to describe calm, do you? You use that to de- describe a storm. If you're calm and I look at you and I say, you're mega calm. <laughs> Tell me what Pastor Craig's like. He's intensely calm. He's mega calm. You're like, good thing. He's a big guy. I don't I want him on my side. But this calm was so supernatural that they could say nothing else about it. The calm didn't match the turmoil. The calm was greater than the turmoil. It was perfectly still. This raging sea was now a a placid pond. And I want you to catch the miracle here. The wind was coming down, Luke's Gospel says, right on that sea, stirring them up. Jesus stopped the source, the wind that was causing the waves. But as you have given your kids baths over the years in the bathtub and they do that swoosh thing the tuna back and forth in the bathtub and the water starts to slosh and they roll with it right and then pretty soon whoop the water comes up over the side boom and gets all over your lap and then you say hush that's enough out of you be still and they stop and what do you notice when they stop the water's got to calm back down here in this miracle don't miss this jesus says to the wind stop and then he says to the waves be still. The waves that were coming up, miraculously, placid lake. That which is loud, wind was blowing, howling, they were yelling just to hear themselves, was complete and utter calm. It was eerie still. Have you ever been there? I just got back from a camping trip with my son two weeks ago. And there was a nice wind at night that went through the trees that helped us sleep, except one night. There was nothing. I don't know if I listened to too much loud music in my earlier years, but I could hear that little ee, that little ring in my ears. And you're like, this is, cal- this is too calm. Jesus is God. He has power over all things, and he points out to the weakness of their faith and questions their fear as if revealing the fact that they had not needed to do that. So the calm before the storm, we saw the storm during the storm, which was quite the storm, a storm like no other storm. Now let's close with this today. This is a storm after the calm. Notice in verse 41, it says, they feared exceedingly. Wait a minute. Verse 40 said they were already afraid. They're afraid. They're crying out, God, don't you care? We're perishing. We're going down. They cry out to him. He calms it. Now they're really scared. 
very much afraid. I want you to picture this moment, the roaring of the wind, the waves, the shouting to the silent dead calm. And all you can hear is the water dripping onto the boat from where it saturated your clothes and your hair and your skin. And you're still, and everything's just, just calm, completely calm. The present state was so out of line with who the reality of God is and what he's doing that now he turns his words, he turns his attention from the elements, from the wind and the waves, and he turns it back to the hearts of these men. Peace be still. Now you, why are you afraid? Where's your faith? Is it to say, Come on, boys. You can do better than that. As a father of two boys, I've said that a time or two. As a loving father, desiring to see my kids experience the best that we and my wife have for them. And if I'm evil and I want that, how much more does God want that? The storm turns from the sea and begins to rage in their souls. At that moment, they're confronted with the full force of who God is and the weakness of their own strength, and they're completely undone. Is it to say, who is this? This is the storm after the calm. It's turned from nature to their soul. The word rages with their fear and unbelief. Who is this? This is God Almighty, the creator of the universe, and yet, and yet, the Savior who will get in your boat and participate with you and with me because he loves us. Psalm 46.10 says, Be still, know that I'm God. I'll be exalted in the nations. I'll be exalted in the earth. The word be still literally means to be quiet. Some translations say cease striving. Some translations say relax. Relax. And let go. I firmly believe that's a word for some of you this morning. Because the calm that Jesus gives is greater than the turmoil of the greatest storm. You might not know how it's going to work out. But Jesus said, trust me. So you're trusting God through this. And when Jesus says, let's go over. Saints, this morning you can be sure that you won't go under. Amen.